Good morning, Crossbridge, and happy Father's Day. We are so glad that you chose to spend this morning with us. After, whenever you leave the service this morning, we have some specialty donuts out in the lobby for you all. And by specialty, I mean like maple bacon, Oreo covered, awesomeness. So that's happening. Don't miss that. And um, if you are a guest with us today, we are so glad that you're here. And we would love for, to get to know you better. There's some connect cards in the um, seat pocket in front of you. And we would love for you to fill that out and put it into the offering um, bag that comes around later in the service. And in case I haven't met some of you yet, my name is Jennifer and I'm the family pastor here at Crossbridge. So summertime can be a little crazy here, there, and everywhere, right? But we want to help make sure you get connected and stay connected here at the church. And so we have some great opportunities for you to connect this summer. Um, one of our biggest ones is our summer sessions. It's adult Bible studies. So we have a woman's and a men's. Uh, they meet on Tuesday evenings. They just started last Tuesday, but it's not too late for you to dive in. And so you can go to our uh, crossbridge.cc slash events page and it's every, all the details and registration. You can even register for childcare, which is awesome. Um, and so we'd love for you to do that. But on that um, events page, you're also going to see student ministry events. You're going to see kids serve days, kids summer fun days, and also July 15th, a church-wide serve day. Uh, the best news about that is it's going to be in the air conditioning. So we would love everybody age five and up to come and serve at our All Church Day. We are, our goal is to package 6,000 meals in two hours. So we need all of you to come. And there is a nominal fee for it, but it helps us pay for all the food that we're packaging. So we would love for you to grab your friends and family and kids and all come serve together on Saturday, um, July 15th. Um, how many of you <coughs> sent kids, <coughs> sorry, um, to kids camp last week or sending their youth to youth camp next week. Anybody? Yeah, awesome. We had so much fun. We, we just got back from kids camp uh, two days ago. I just woke up from my nap after kids camp this morning, and, um, and we just had an incredible time. Y'all, we had kids um, come that had never been to a church. We had kids from Buddhist families, and we had kids that also... Um, had never heard of really about Jesus before. And we got to spend all week with them at kids camp. We had incredible camp counselors who just poured truth into them. But also like some of your kiddos are here every Sunday and they have heard about Jesus, but they got to really ask hard questions and dig into their faith, grow in their relationship with the Lord, and also just have amazing worship um, together. So um, camps and also just every Sunday, our ministries are fueled by your generosity. And so at Crossbridge, we give joyfully. We are grateful that we get to give back to God what he's given us. And so later in the service, we are going to have the offering come by. If you're a guest, you can put your connect card in there, but we would love for you um, to give um, graciously this morning. Um, we are going to continue our series called uh, Rediscovering the Joy. And um, before we do that, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? This morning, we're reading Galatians 2, 11 through 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. But before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 
But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners in Christ, then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if we rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to to be a transgressor. For though the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is God's word. You can be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that now we get to sit under your word. Lord, we believe that when we open the Bible, you open your mouth. That you will speak to us through the words on these page by your Holy Spirit. And so Holy Spirit, as we sang earlier, we, we want you. You're wanted here. We draw near to you now, God. And your word says if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So draw near to us now. No matter what our week was like, no matter what our night was like, no matter what our morning so far has been like, we all need to hear from you. We need a moment with you, an encounter with you, by your spirit, through your word. So come and do that now. Maybe just take a moment and just ask the Lord to speak to your heart this morning. Just quiet yourself before him. Say, Lord, uh, speak. Say something with my name on it today. I want to hear from you. Help us now, Lord, to hear your voice, to believe, and to obey. We pray this in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Well, it's pretty amazing what we remember and the things that we forget. Uh, This past Tuesday, uh, Jennifer mentioned our summer sessions started. And in the men's session, there was this icebreaker question about famous movie, your favorite movie lines. And so we went around the room and introduced themselves. We said our favorite movie lines. And the whole time, uh, I'm sitting at my table thinking about what movie line am I going to say. And I was just amazed at how many movie lines was popping in my head from every kind of movie in the world. From, you know, The Princess Bride, uh, various Star Wars quotes. Uh, you know, other like kind of, you know, just dumb quotes, just amazing things you can remember. I can remember all that, but I forget the one thing I went to the grocery store for. <laughs> you ever done that before? You go to the grocery store, you have one thing you're supposed to get, you come home with five, but not the thing your wife told you to go, right, fellas? You know, uh, at least that's for me, and maybe, maybe ladies, you have that issue too. You know, I, I can remember obscure details about weird things, but then you know, I'll just forget something really important I was supposed to do all day that I wrote down three different places, and in the end, it somehow just slipped out of my mind. My worst moment of forgetting something was my very first, uh, we call them at Crossbridge Parent Commissioning, but at the church I was at, it was called a baby dedication. New parent, new baby, they wanted to, you know, kind of just dedicate themselves to raising that baby in the way of Jesus, and we prayed for, I was a very young pastor, you know, I was doing, I was leading this service, and I was going to do this, and I went, and I, I just thought, I know all these parents that are dedicating their babies. Yeah, you know where this is going. And so, um, and sure enough, you know, I had some of my best friends standing in front of me and I couldn't say their names to save my life. He put a gun in my head at that moment. I'd be like, well, I guess I'm going to Jesus because I cannot tell you their names. I mean, Scott and Leslie, you know, Gilberry, I know their names right here. And right now I can see them. But in that moment, it was, it was just gone. And it was just so embarrassing. I mean, he looked at me like, are you an idiot? I'm like, yeah, I, I am, you know. And, and he's like, Scott. And I'm like, Scott, yes, of course. We're dear friends. <laughs> I'm the worst pastor ever, ever. 
Well, we're, we're in a message series uh, through the book of Galatians, the New Testament, called Rediscovering the Joy. And the Galatians had lost the joy of their salvation, and they were in danger of, of losing it and losing the freedom and the hope and the rest that their salvation would bring to them through Jesus Christ because they were forgetting something much more important than their friend's name or uh, the one item at the grocery store they were supposed to get. They were forgetting the gospel. They were forgetting the good news for bad and broken people that God sent his son Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, to live a perfect, sinless life. Then, as an offering in our place, to offer himself as a substitute, as our sacrifice, bearing our sin, bearing our shame, and taking the just, rightly deserved punishment for sin in our place. And then rising from the dead uh, to show that that sin was paid for perfectly, completely, forever. They were in danger of forgetting that their relationship with God was based on only what Jesus had done, not on the things that they had to do. And so the Apostle Paul writes this letter. We've been studying it for the past few weeks. We'll study it for the rest of the summer. He writes this letter to this group of people living in this, this region called Galatia. And he writes to say, hey, anytime someone comes in... And they say that Jesus is great, but you need to add this to it. That's not the gospel. That Jesus plus anything is not the good news. And so, you know, you, you come to a service like this and you're like, well, you know, I, I know the gospel in my head, but, but Paul wanted them to know more than what was in their head. He wanted it to drop so deep in their hearts that their whole life was reoriented around the gospel. And that everyone needs to hear the gospel over and over. We never grow past it, we've been saying. In fact, the gospel by one person has been called the milk and the meat of the Christian faith. Some people might say, well, why are we talking about Jesus dying so much? Isn't that just the beginner thing? Isn't that just kind of the milk? I want some deeper meat. Well, then I would say, friend, you haven't gone deep enough into the gospel. Because it is the milk and the meat of the Christian faith. It is not just the door by which you enter the Christian faith. It's the mansion you live in that has endless rooms that you'll be forever exploring. It's not just the starting line. It's the whole race for the Christian. And so we're prone to forget it. We're prone to kind of add things to Jesus. We're prone to kind of make our life centered around something other than Jesus and who he is and what he's done and what he's doing right now uh, by the Holy Spirit in us as he's, the Holy Spirit's applying the gospel and all that Jesus paid for to our hearts. But we're in great company because we're not the only people. We're not the first people to kind of have trouble remembering, no, my life, my acceptance, my purpose, everything is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. Even the apostles themselves would forget. And that's where we find ourselves in this passage that Jennifer read to us today. Because now the Apostle Paul is talking about a confrontation that he had with the Apostle Peter. Now Cephas, and, and it's interesting, I told you last week, there's different reasons why they include it. The main reason they include Cephas' name here is another name for Peter, because Cephas is the Aramaic version of Peter. And so uh, he, some people say Paul's making a point, and, and for that, again, but Cephas and Peter are synonymous. They are the same person in this passage. So as we join it, he's confronting Cephas. So let's look at it again, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So, you know, all those people that say like, we should be like a New Testament church. They had no problems. Clearly, you've never read the New Testament. Um, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. What's he saying here? So James, it's the half brother of Jesus. Can you go back one slide for me, Steve? Um, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he kind of was like, you know, a, a leader of the Jerusalem church and one of the apostles and everything. So so some men came from, from James. And so it says that Peter was eating with the Gentiles. Now, when he says eating with the Gentiles, it means like he was living like a Gentile. He was not abiding by the ceremonial laws. He was eating their food. He, he was their friend. He was hanging out with them, doing life with them. He, he was not abiding by all the ceremonial laws that, that Hebrews had were, because they believed that if they ate with the Gentile, they would be ceremonially unclean. They couldn't worship God because the Gentiles worshipped idols. The Gentiles didn't follow all the purification laws. And so uh, to be with them, a, a, a Hebrew thought, well, now you're ceremonially unclean. You can't worship God. You're not clean before God. You're not right before God. 
But Peter had been eating with them because Peter had been the first person to get a vision that the, the gospel is not just for Jews, it's for all men and women through Jesus Christ. And so he'd been eating with them. Next slide, please. So they came, these people came, he drew back and he separated himself. So when these Hebrews came, because of their, his fear for them, he stops eating with the Gentiles, fearing the circumcision party, fearing this group of people that came and said, Jesus is great, but you need to do Jesus plus all the ceremonial laws. Now, two words never should go together like circumcision and party, but that's a whole other thing to talk about. <laughs> And so then the rest of the Jews, the rest of the Jewish Christians, acted hypocritically along with him. Because now they're act before they've been like, oh, isn't Jesus great? And they were having a maple bacon donut and with the Gentiles, and it was all great. But now these people have come in and are like, oh, we don't, we don't do that. We, we, we keep ourselves ceremonially clean. Paul's saying, what are you doing? Why are you changing the way you act? And he says, they acted so appropriately that even Barnabas, Barnabas is one of his traveling buddies, is a you know, very strong follower of Jesus. Even Barnabas is led astray by their hypocrisy. I mean, Peter should know better. He had a vision that you can read about in Acts chapter 10, where Jesus called no food unclean and said, don't call something unclean that I haven't said is unclean. And through this vision of food, Peter saw that the, the Gentiles could come to faith. And after that vision, the first Gentiles did come to faith. And so Peter should know better, but now he has, I love the word that, that he puts in there, fearing. The, fearing of, the fear of people now has made Peter step back. He wanted their approval. And so he's forgetting his approval is in Jesus and Jesus alone, not what people think, not what religious leaders think, not what anyone thinks. So he pulls back and he acts, according to Paul here, hypocritically. And that's, we all know, you know, we all say, people say like, oh, the Christian church is so filled with hypocrites. A hypocrite is, of course, usually when you say something and you act differently. And that's what Peter had been doing. He had been saying, oh, the Gentiles, they're my brothers and sisters in Jesus. But now he's acting like he needs to be separate from them to be clean before God. And Paul is confronting him to his face. And notice he said, and go back one more slide, verse 12. There you go. He says, because he stood condemned. And what he means by that is not condemned before God, like he's not a Christian, but he stood guilty. Like he had, he had no leg to stand on. He knows he had done wrong. And Paul's like, I'm in his, I'm in his face. I'm confronting him about what he's doing. Okay, verse 14. There should be two slides ahead for you, Steve. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all. Now, this can be a little cumbersome, but we'll walk through it. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? You haven't been washing your hands like you should, not for cleanliness, but for ceremonial sake. You haven't been, you know, you're eating all the food they're eating. You're hanging out with them. You're not following the ceremonial laws. In fact, you're, you're living like a Gentile would. But now, now you're saying, oh, well, wait a second. Maybe we should follow the ceremonial laws. Maybe you should get circumcised. Maybe you should do all the things that ceremonially make you right with God that we have in uh, the, the Hebrew text. He's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? How can you, you're living this way. How are you now forcing the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, when he's saying that, he's like, listen, we know who we are and we know exactly. But here's the thing. Even though, yes, we're Jews by birth. Look what he says in verse 16. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. You like how Paul repeats himself there? He basically says a sentence and then says it again in another way. And that's you know, basically what he does. He goes, you're not going to be justified. Now, what is justified is the idea of being made right, made right with God. How are we good with God? How can you wake up and go, God, are we good? And God goes, yeah, we're good. Well, are you done by the works of the law? 
by following all parts of the law, the law being the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. Well, they can only go for a certain extent in the civil law because the Romans ruled them. They can't have their own government. So it was ceremonial and moral. Well, Jesus didn't nullify the moral. He just did, obeyed it perfectly because most of the moral law in the Old Testament is repeated in the, in the New Testament. But the ceremonial law, He fulfills. He didn't do away with it. He completed it. He completed and fulfilled it through His perfect life so that He has perfectly obeyed all the laws. He has perfectly completed that for us in living in our place. And so what Paul is saying here, no one's made right, no one's good with God because they obeyed all the law perfectly because no one can obey all the law perfectly. What makes you good with God, what makes you justified is the person and the work of Jesus. His perfect obedience, his perfect sacrifice, his perfect resurrection. Because of Jesus' victory, if you have put your faith in that, because notice what he says there. He says that we have believed in Christ Jesus. He's not talking about like I mentally think this happened. No, he's talking about a life surrender. I have trusted in Jesus. I am saying that, that what makes me good with God today is not my perfect obedience. What makes me good with God today is Jesus' perfect obedience. What makes me good with God today is not when I, that I can say, God, look at my heart, look at my motives. No, no, no. Because I know in my deepest part, even my good motives are tainted by, I hope this works out. I hope, I, they're still self-motivated. What makes me good with God, what makes me justified, is the work and person of Jesus and His victory in my place. So Paul is saying, let's be real clear. God doesn't have fellowship with someone because of a race. God has fellowship with people because and he's good with people because of Jesus. And he says, now, now look, the, the key sentence right here in this whole passage we've read is what he says in verse 14. When he saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. So Paul is not, Paul, when Paul confronts Peter here and he says, hey, you're acting hypocritically. You're acting like this way in front of this group of people. You're acting like now these other people are here. You're acting this way. He's not just saying, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be, don't be weird. Don't be, don't be like acting like all of a sudden you're superior now racially or ethnically or whatever like that. He, he, he doesn't go to there. He goes straight to, listen, listen, your conduct, the way you're acting, you're not in step with, you're not in alignment with the gospel. It's like you ever had your car out of alignment where the steering wheel has to be turned like this so just so you can drive straight, you know, until you get that fixed? It's, it's like that because if you had the steering wheel straight, your car would just go off into the next lane. And so it has to get, you have to go and you have to get the alignment fixed. So now it's, it's lined up. Now you can, steering wheel straight, alignment's done, you can drive straight. Same thing here. Because the, the word there used for in step is this idea of, of a straight path. It has the root part of the, the word in Greek is ortho, like orthodontist. Makes your teeth straight. It's the same kind of thing. This alignment with the gospel. And so what do we get from this one line? We get this idea that Paul tries to explain in this letter and the whole basically New Testament, all the New Testament writers are trying to tell us this truth. That the gospel affects everything. The gospel affects everything. That when your li life is in alignment with who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what he's doing, because it's not just news about what he's done, it's also news about what he's doing. What is he doing? His spirit is in you. His spirit is in you applying all that he paid for. And it's about what he will do. What will he do? He will return to set up his eternal kingdom. It affects every area of our life. Remember, the gospel's news, not advice. It's news that demands a response. It's news that changes everything. Just like if you got some life-altering news and your life changed. You got a new job. You got married. There's news about something that happened, and now life is different. The gospel's news about something that happened through Jesus, and it affects everything. Everything. Leslie Newbegin says it this way. The Christian story provides us with a set of lenses, not something for us to look at, but to look through. Peter was not looking through the lenses of the gospel when the circumcision party arrived. Somehow in his heart, and I love it that it's in the Bible that they didn't leave this out because it gives me so much hope for myself when my heart gets out of alignment. <laughs> 
And that, that, but when they came, he was like, no, no, these are my Jewish brothers, and I, I, I want to seem like I'm in good with them. And so he, he changed the way he acted. And by doing that, this fear of man that took over his heart showed that he wasn't in alignment with the gospel. That he wasn't in alignment with the fact that because of Jesus, I have nothing to prove and no one to impress. My life is perfect. My acceptance with God, my, my being right with God legally, my forgiveness before, all of that is made right through the person and work of Jesus. That God does not exclude people anymore because of the ceremonial law. If he excludes people all, it's only about what they have done with Jesus. And so our whole life is to be changed by the gospel. In fact, Paul will say it this way in the book of Romans. He'll spend 11 chapters unpacking the gospel. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, which he spent 11 chapters unpacking, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Which, so even though our life is based on what Jesus has done, it doesn't mean we don't do anything. We just do things because of what he's done. We don't do things to get things done. We don't do the Christian faith so that my relate. So what will be done is I'll be pleasing before God. No, I'm pleasing before God because of Jesus and his work. And because that's been done... Now I do things in, in light of that, because of that, from that, not for that. So because of his mercy, my whole life is now this living sacrifice to be. It affects everything now because I'm not doing it to earn his approval. I'm doing it because I have his approval. And he's given me his Holy Spirit, which is changing me, who is changing me from the inside out. Peter in this moment, somehow gets all caught up in the moment, all caught up in the people, because they seemed influential, Paul said, and he forgets. And Paul's like, oh no, you won't forget. I'm going to remind you. I'm going to get in your face and say, no, 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 no. You're out of, you're out of alignment. You're, 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 you're veering off into a lane that says it's Jesus plus something, and we're not going to get out of alignment. So look what he says in verse 17, back in Galatians chapter 2. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. See, the response then to some people, when, when we talk about how our faith alone, how, how are we good with God? Well, we're only good with God because of Jesus. Well, some people then say, well, if I'm good with God only because of Jesus, then I can do whatever I want. Now stick with me, I'm about to say something that might throw you off for a second. That technically is true. The question will then be, what do you want? Because your wanter should have changed. Because if you've really met Christ, you've received the Holy Spirit. You're not perfect. You're still going to struggle with sin until Jesus returns or you meet him. But he begins this work of regeneration, this work of renewal in you, this work where he's changing over time your desires. The work of sanctification is the proper term, is the kind of biblical theological term for it, the, the idea of spiritual growth. But when someone says, you, you know, I, I had this conversation sadly before where I, years ago I was talking to this, working with this married couple and the guy was being unfaithful to his wife and, you know, we were having a conversation about how this was sin. And he goes, oh, I know it's sin. But, you know, God has to forgive me, right? Those are dangerous things to say. Because right here is what Paul is saying. Listen, Christ is not a servant of sin. You don't just say, well, me and God are good because Jesus died for my sins. And he has to forgive me if I say, God, forgive me, right? Or are you coming with a contrite heart? Are you coming with a heart that really wants God to be right with God? Or are you coming trying to use God so religiously, you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. Paul is going, no, no, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not just talking about, oh, me and God are good, so I can do whatever. No, no, no. Christ is not a servant of sin. Certainly not. We are not, we're not going to, you know, we're not, we're not doing that at all. The Holy Spirit is changing our desires. And then he says in verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law, so I might live to God. And that's a confusing statement. And it's, you know, kind of like, well, what are you saying here? Well, the moral law 
in the Old Testament, let's say the Ten Commandments, all the thou shalt nots, okay? They reveal what is required of us. The ceremonial laws, the washing, the clean, unclean laws, the sacrificial system, it shows we can't keep the law. It shows that there is an uncleanliness about our heart, about our lives. We need sacrifices and all of that. And so Paul is saying, the, what the law has done for me, what the Old Testament has done for me, the Hebrew scriptures, it is revealed that I can't be right with God. And so I'm dying to living my life with God as my life with God is not going to be how perfectly can I obey the law anymore. That's not my life with God anymore. Not trying to be a good little religious person anymore. That's not my deal. That's why he's saying I died to the law. But I've done that because now I can really live for him. Now I can live. Now I'm right with him. Now I'm good with him. Now I don't have to worry about, well, did I wash right? Did I do this? Did I do the sacrifice right? Did I pray all that right? Did I touch that dead thing and I wasn't supposed to hit anything? It was a Sabbath day. Did I accidentally pick up something? Did I walk too many steps today? I mean, all that stuff could just drive, you know, he's just like, oh, he, he can put all that away. He's dead to that now. And now I'm just right with God because Jesus has been victorious over sin, Satan, and death. That's what he's saying here. And then he says, probably the most famous lines in the book of Galatians, if you've been in church at all, you've probably heard this before. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Now these verses are talking about an amazing reality that when we put our faith, when we surrender our lives, we put our trust in, we believe in Christ. Like, yes, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are, and I entrust my life. I surrender my life to you. There is this, this theological concept called union with Christ. We are so united with him. Where this cruci he says, it's like I have been crucified with Christ. My sin is already judged. My sin is already paid for. And now Christ lives in me. His righteous life, his righteous record has been applied to my life. So when the Father looks at me, my sin is paid for and my righteousness is perfect. That means yesterday I could have just blown it. I could have woke up in a bad mood with a headache. I could have snapped at my wife, been ugly to my kids, just, just kind of just in a sour, ugly mood all day. And then later that night, kind of come to my senses and go, man, I was a jerk today. I'm just giving an arbitrary thing. This stuff never, <laughs> this never happens. I'm a pastor, you know, professional. Um, all my days are perfect. Um, what do I do that night when I come to my senses? i got to preach tomorrow. Oh, I'm unworthy of preaching. And oh, my gosh, I'm such a hypocrite and loser. Okay, what can I do? Should, well, you know, I, I should just pray longer tonight. I should do all this. Then, no. You know what I do? I just say, I am so grateful, God, that my standing with you was not affected today. You loved me all day in spite of who I was. And I'm sorry. Continue just to work in my heart. Continue just to work in my heart. But I'm so grateful that right now, in fact, all day, this is, what, this, is what, this is what makes people go, I don't know about the gospel. What I'm about to tell you. When I was at my worst today, you looked at me and still saw Jesus and said, we're good. Amen. I mean, that's what's staggering. That's, that's why some people will say the gospel is scandalous. How can he look at me in my worst and say we're good because of Jesus? Because if I can out -sin his grace, it's not grace. And his grace isn't sufficient. And it's, it's just amazing because I'm united with him. And so look what he says then. He is the life I now live. I'm living by 
faith, trust and surrender in the Son of God. I'm not living my life based on, can I obey all the rules? Can I pray? You know, am I having my 15 minute quiet time every day if you grew up Baptist? Am I saying all the right prayers? Am I praying the rosary? Did I go, did I go and do all my confessions in Hail Mary if you're Catholic? Or, or wherever it is you're from. And whatever background it is, whatever rules you think you got to follow, that's not the life I live anymore. The life I live is I just trust Jesus and I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. Why? Why would I do that? Because he loved me. And he didn't just love me with a platitude. Oh, isn't it great that God loves me? How do I know that he loved me? Well, he says it in the text. Because he gave himself for me. He, He offered himself in my guilty place. I mean, just a moment. Just pretend it's just you and the Lord in the room. And if you can, go to your darkest, vile moment. The moment you hope no one in the room ever finds out about. He loved you then. And he gave himself for that. He paid for that moment. When you said that, when you thought that, when you did that, when you touched that, when you went there, when you did whatever, he loved you and he gave himself for you. Your sin and my sin, it is vile and wicked, but his mercy is greater. His grace is more powerful. It's your sin and my sin can be overwhelming in shame. But his grace overwhelms that. His grace is more powerful. That is a small little wave in a kiddie pool. And his grace is an ocean tidal wave. And Paul is saying, I am done with religious living. I'm free. So if Paul was here today, what would he do? He would go after the service and he would have a maple bacon donut for the glory of Jesus. Unless he was watching his calories and cholesterol and all that, but whatever. You know, that's more health, not righteousness. All right? So let's apply this real quickly, okay? Because I've spent most of my time, this is a very like unpacking kind of day where I had to unpack these words. But let's, let's bring it down. If the gospel affects everything, then how do we apply this to day-to-day life? How do we actually start living this out? And, you know, you, you, we don't go out of here going, yeah, the gospel affects everything. I don't know what that means, but, you know, the gospel affects everything. Well, let's, let's try to understand what it means. Let's take one area of life, because we could take 100 areas. Let's take an area that we could apply it to marriage. Not everyone's married. We could apply it to parenting. It's Father's Day. Not everyone's a parent. Let's apply it to suffering, because everyone suffers. How can you suffer in step with the truth of the gospel. What would be out of step when we suffer? And that, let's just say suffering is a really bad day, life-altering pain. You just, you, you pick. Well, living out of step is having the idea that God owes me a safe life because I'm a good person. Or, or, or it might be that God's paying me back for something bad I did. I did this in college, and now this thing's happening for me, and I, I, I deserve this bad thing. Or, you know, I, I'm a good person. I, I go to church. I try to, you know, be faithful to my spouse. I'm raising my kids. Or, you know, I'm single, and I'm being pure. I'm not doing anything crazy and all that that all my other friends are doing. And doesn't God owe me a safe life because I'm a good person? That's Jesus plus thinking. Jesus plus my goodness. That's out of step. And you try to figure out, why is this happening to me? Friend, you know that'll just drive you crazy. That'll just crush you. I mean, yeah, there's sometimes there are consequences for our actions. And you pretty much know. Yeah, I didn't do this, and this happened. I did this, and this happened. Okay. But is he paying you back? Or is it just the consequences? According to the gospel, it's just the consequences of your actions. Jesus took all the payment. So what would it look like to suffer in step with the gospel? It would look like this. Number one, the gospel humbles me out of being mad at God. I can't sit and be mad at God. Why can't I be mad at God? Well, I think I'm this good person. I'm suffering unjustly. Friend, the gospel reminds us 
that the best person in the world suffered unjustly. The one who did nothing wrong, never had an impure thought, never said a crossword, never sinned, suffered terribly. Where do we get the idea that good people that live good lives and bad people that live bad lives, so the bad people must suffer and the good people, only good things should happen to them. Where did we get that idea from? Not the Bible. Because the Bible says it's a fallen world and we're all going to face the effects of it. And Jesus, he embraced it willingly. He was a, the best person ever. He suffered terribly. I, I can't be mad at God. This is life in a fallen world. And then the gospel affirms me out of feeling guilty. I mean, does God discipline us? Well, Scripture tells us yes. He allows things to happen to discipline us, to train us, to trust Him, even when life isn't going the way we want it to go. The fallen world still hits us, and He allows it to hit us because He's showing, hey, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. But here's the thing. Jesus got the punishment for my sin. This can't be, this, this moment I'm in is not punishment. And when we realize we're accepted in Christ, our suffering then has the potential to humble us and actually strengthen us rather than embitter and weaken us. And so that's just one example. Tim Keller says, the gospel is to be applied to every area of thinking, feeling, relation, and behaving. Every area. You can apply it to every area. And if you read through the New Testament, you realize... That's what the writers are doing. The Apostle Paul says, well, he's talking about marriage. Well, husbands, love your wives. That's great advice. But as Christ loved the church, remember who your model is and what the power is. It goes back to the gospel. Sexual purity. Well, you should probably watch that. But, but he, he says, no, no, you remember you're, you were bought with a price. Your body is no longer your own because Christ paid for it with his body. Therefore, honor God with your body. Money and generosity. We should give because church needs our money. Poor people need our money. No, we give because of what Christ has given. And when we see the generosity of he who was rich became poor for us, how can we not generously give? Power. Well, we use power. We get authority. We make things happen and all that. But we use power as, as a servant. The most powerful person in the universe put a towel around his arm and a, a bowl of water and washed this dirty feet of his disciples, and then died for his, exec died for his enemies and forgave his executioners. That's power. You can apply the gospel to gender, family, money, work life, discouragement, the physical world, self-control, your body, the way we treat non-believers, human authority, human dignity, guilt, self-image, joy, humor, right living, eating, drinking, class, and race. Who Jesus is and what he has done has bottomless implications for everything. That's why the late Tim Keller, it was one of my favorite quotes of his, it's not on the screen, is he says, the gospel is not the ABCs. It's not how we start this thing. It's not for the beginners. We always say that for kids. Oh, you got to learn your ABCs. And then D to Z is us just working really hard. Now he'll say the gospel is the, he said the gospel is the A to Z of the Christian life. Over everything is Jesus is Lord. And that means his payment sufficient. His death completed the payment for sin. His resurrection triumphant. And then the last thing is just on a, you know, most of us, maybe, maybe you're not in a hard suffering moment. And, you know, you can take all these areas and just do countless study on all of it. But my encouragement would just be read the New Testament because this is where you'll find all this. That's all the authors are doing are just applying the gospel to our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. But let's just say, you have this bad moment tomorrow. Let's say tomorrow morning is a terrible Monday morning for you. And you get up and you're running late and your spouse says something to you and you're just like, really? You know, I got to go. I'm making call. No, I can't do that for you. And you just have this not good moment. And you, you get in the car and, and you, you get to work. And then later you're just like, you just, you're, you're feeling conviction and you're just like, oh. 
What do you do? Do you just go, I'm the worst? Jesus, just forgive me, I'm the worst. How can you apply the gospel to moments when you react badly? This is where most of us live, moments of reactivity. I'm going to give you five questions that I do very quickly. I, I do this um, if I'm here at the church and someone talks to me and says something and all of a sudden I, I, feel, I feel just a moment of reaction where, you know, it's that fight, flight, or freeze where you just have that moment of feeling threatened so you either snap back or it could happen here, it could happen at a restaurant, happen whatever. Five questions to ask yourself. Just This is how to apply the gospel. There's just a moment of reactivity. You ask yourself what happened, what happened, I was running late, she asked me to help, and, you know, she was trying to tell me what, when the kids needed to be picked up. I just remind myself what happened. Second question, what am I feeling? Well, I, and this might be hard for some of us, but you think about what am I feeling in that, in that moment? Well, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling late, I'm feeling tense, I'm feeling a little like, oh, I've got to get going. I'm feeling like, what, don't you see that I'm running late and you're asking me to do something? Which leads to the third question, what is the story I'm telling myself? The story I'm telling myself is, she doesn't care that I'm running late. Nobody cares about me. i got to take care of myself. i got to get out the door. i got to make this thing happen. And I just, you know, everyone just needs to shut up and leave me alone. Again, these are arbitrary things. These are the things that never happen to me. <laughs> Fourth question is a money question. What does the gospel say? What does the gospel say? Well, the gospel says in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus holds all things together. That right now the universe is not going to unravel because I'm running late on a Monday morning. And that this morning if I'm late, what's the worst that could happen? If I get there late, my boss says something, you know, you know the worst, okay, the worst could happen is maybe I could lose my job. Would, my, would I be still loved by God and taken care of. Well, according to the gospel promises in the scripture, yes. And so I just reorient my story. I reorient my feelings. I reorient what happened around what does the gospel say? That Jesus is in control. That it's, my wife is not my enemy. That the worst thing that could happen to me is not being late. The worst thing that could happen to me is I could spend eternity in hell apart from God. And those are all real stresses and everything, but I just need to stay calm and remember who's in control. And then the last question is, what do I do? What is the counter-instinctual action? What counter-instinctual action is needed? And I got all these questions from a guy named Rick Velotis, so I want you to know I'm not that smart. Um, what do I do about it? Well, probably what I need to do is not tell my wife not to tell me about things in the morning. I need to go apologize. And I need to make, you know, just not stay up maybe as late the night before doing whatever I was doing. You know, just, there's just counter instinctual actions because the action I wanted to take was, hey, in the morning when I'm getting ready for work, don't ask me to do anything. I got to have boundaries. I need to do something counter-instinctual. <laughs> You're laughing because you know that's not going to work, you know? <laughs> but, the gospel, but without the gospel, we're morons, you know? <laughs> At least I am. But the gospel, and so it leads me to a counter-instinct, a counter to go and, and humble myself, to ask forgiveness to, to, for, for my wife, to, to just, just to calm myself down, and, and to let the Holy Spirit just convict me and mold me. Five questions like this. Take you five minutes. That was probably less than five minutes that we just walked through it. But you just take the kind of questions like this, these moments, and you just say, how do I just stay in line with the truth of the gospel? So the question today, as we end, is are you in step with the gospel today? This isn't about walking some tightrope, like, oh my gosh, I could fall and die any moment. This is an invitation to dance. And dancing is fun and intimate. And that's what Jesus invites you to. Come dance with him. He'll be joyful. You'll be very close to him. And you just stay close to him and let him lead. And just remember who you are. Today in Christ, you are accepted. You are not alone. You are empowered. 
You have spiritual authority. You have a calling. You are forgiven. You are cleansed. Stay close to Him. Stay in line with Him. And let Him lead. Whatever you're adding to the gospel, it's like Peter. It's because you're afraid. We're afraid Jesus won't be enough. He'll be enough. Let Him lead. Let's pray. So whatever stood out to you in the message, just talk to the Lord about that right now. Or is there something you were convicted of? Do you know there's an area of your life where it's probably not in step with the gospel? You're not living like Jesus is Lord and you're completely accepted right now because of him. And maybe it's with an area we mentioned just in passing. Holy Spirit, you are the great applier of the scripture. So now apply to our hearts the text we studied today. Let the, the, the good news of the victory of Jesus begin to be what we run everything in our life by. From how we pay our bills and, and manage our money to how we work on the job to how we raise our kids, to how the fathers in this room father. No father feels adequate, Lord. But it's not about our adequacy. It is about your sufficiency. And even if we blow it, and every dad in the room that's been a dad for more than five minutes has blown it, Jesus is greater still. You can redeem our blowing it. You forgive our blowing in. We're still good with you because of, the, because of the victory of Jesus. Friend, are you good with God today? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you surrendered to him? If not, there's going to be a prayer on the screen. You should just pray those words. You should make those words into your words. It's not about the words. Remember, it's about your heart saying, Jesus, I trust you. I surrender myself to you. I'm only going to be good with God because Jesus, what you've done. And so I trust my life to you. What if you did that right now? You just gave yourself to him. And if so, you do that today for the first time, tell somebody. Tell somebody you came with. Tell one of our prayer team members at the end of the service. Tell somebody. Let's worship him now. Through singing, through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Would you stand with me? Let's worship him now.